Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's AU Summer Series for Seminarians. I'm so excited because I was like, I'm going to wait until I have about 20 people and then I have 20 people at 401. So it's great that you are with us today. I'm excited about today's conversation because it's an opportunity for all of us to gain a deeper understanding about religious freedom and from the perspective of many different voices. And so um, with the introduction and welcome, I would like to say I'm Dr. Sabrina Dent. I'm the Senior Faith Advisor here at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, a big part of my job is about faith organizing and outreach. And so I work with many different coalition partners, including those that will be um, speaking on today's call. So I want to share a little bit more information with you about the work of Americans United. And so I'm going to stop my share, um, stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces. Hello to everyone. And feel free to say hello in the chat. And also feel free to tell us where you're located geographically. Um, if you want to share that information, if you're a seminarian that's with us, please feel free to share your school. Um, so again, I just want to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm really excited to have all of you here with us um, today. As you will learn is I will be your series um, facilitator for the next four weeks. That's if you choose to join us every week, and we hope that you will do so. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Americans United, we are a nonpartisan education and advocacy organization that was founded in 1947 by religious leaders whose primary focus was to defend the separation of church and state. And so today, AU uses high impact litigation, powerful lobbying, and grassroots advocacy to protect everyone's First Amendment rights, and I said everyone's. So we engage many different audiences in our work, uh, whether it's secular groups, youth leaders, or and religious leaders. We work with everyone on these issues. And like I said earlier, many coalition partners. So I want you to know that we intentionally chose the name for this series, AU Summer Series for Seminarians, um, as a way of reconnecting to AU's roots that rallied support from religious communities on church state issues while walking alongside our non-religious friends and people and protecting religious freedom for all. And so what better way to continue our work than to offer these trainings and give you an opportunity to connect with experts who can inform, inspire, and mobilize more religious communities to take action on issues that matter to all of us. And so whether that looks like prioritizing public schools by opposing private school vouchers or looking at equal protection under the law for LGBTQ individuals via the Equality Act or the Do No Harm Act, or it could even be about our, our prioritizing access to healthcare for women and families. Just know that Americans United is here to help. And so to help frame today's conversation, I wanna just give you a little bit more insight. So in 2016, the Public Religion Research Institute published a report that revealed that the religious landscape in America is changing and it continues to change. Um, some of their key findings were that white Christians account for fewer than half of the public. And today only 43% of Americans identify as white and Christian and only 30% as white and Protestant. They also found that non-Christian religious groups are growing, but they still only represent less than one in 10 Americans combined. Along with that, atheists and agnostics account for a minority of all religiously unaffiliated, and most of them are secular, and there are also a growing number of nuns. And what I mean by nuns, we're talking about N-O-N-E-S, those people that might uh, not necessarily identify with any particular religious tradition or group. Um, so when you consider all of this data, it is important for us to prioritize conversations about diverse religious traditions and worldviews, which brings us to today's session. 
So today's session, Understanding Religious Freedom, Embracing the Many Voices, is designed for all of us to understand religious freedom via the experiences of racial and religious minority communities who are also involved in the advocacy work. And so I'm delighted that we have with us our panelist, Karen Core Gill, who is the Executive Director for the Seek American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Charles Watson Jr., who is the Director of Education for the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, or BJC, and Rachel Lasser, who is the President and CEO of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, I will inf I will formally introduce them shortly, but before we do, I have just a few housekeeping um, things I want to share with you. So for today's conversation, you may notice that uh, we can all see each other. I, we wanted this to be a Zoom meeting versus a webinar to make it a bit more intimate so we could feel that we're all in a room together. Um, you'll also, so you be, you're able to see the panelists as well as all the other participants. This session is is being recorded um, as, as Zoom helped you to acknowledge when you came into the space, uh, but the session is being recorded and it will be shared for future use with the other participants as well as our panelists for their use. Um, you're welcome to turn off your cameras if you haven't done so already, but at the same time, you're welcome to keep them on and your microphone was muted upon entry. We ask that you keep your microphone muted during the presentations, but we welcome you to participate during the Q&A. And so during that time of the Q&A, we ask that you simply uh, raise your hand to be acknowledged and or you can put your questions in the chat for us to engage you when we come to that time of Q&A. So are we good on that, everyone? All right, great. Thank you for the thumbs up. All right, so with that, I want to introduce our presenters. Um, today we have with us Karen Corgill. She is an accomplished professional with exemplary executive experience. She was the former president and CEO of PARS Environmental Inc., a full service environmental consultant firm based in Robbinsville, New Jersey. Additionally, Karen has been a longtime advisor and volunteer for SALDIF, playing a critical role in the expansion of their legal, um, their law enforcement partner partnership program and the expansion of the seek led internship to New Jersey. Next, we have our guest, Charles Watson Jr., who is a native of Millen, Georgia, and he is the Director of Education at the BJC. Charles' work is focused on expanding the base of support for religious liberty and engaging the next generation of advocates. He is a graduate of the Citadel, and he earned his Master of Divinity degree at Mercer University's McAfee School of Theology. He previously served as a children's director of Buckhead Baptist Church in Atlanta and as a hospice chaplain resident endorsed by the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. It's also important to note that Charles is also a veteran of the United States Air Force. Thank you, Charles, for your service. And lastly, we have Rachel Lasser, who is the president and CEO of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Rachel, um, Rachel joined AU as the president in February of 2018. She is the organization's first non-Christian and female leader in its 73-year history. Rachel is a lawyer, advocate, and strategist who, is who has dedicated her career to making our country more inclusive. In her position at AU, Rachel oversees the organization's work to protect freedom of conscience for all and ensure religion is not used to justify discrimination. Prior to coming to AU, Rachel worked as an educator on white privilege and racism and held positions as deputy director of the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism and was the director of the culture program at Third Way and senior counsel at the National Law Women's Center. Rachel is also a graduate of, a graduate of Harvard University and the University of Chicago Law School. She is also a former board member of NARAL Pro-Choice America. 
So with that, I say welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, we're delighted to have you here with us today. So thank you for joining us. And feel free to take your, um, you can take yourselves off of mute. And um, David, who is working behind the scenes, if you could pin their videos so everyone could see our panelists, that would be wonderful. So thank you all for joining us. I wanna start by asking a question to really bring you more into this conversation. I know I set the tone and just the framework just a little, um, but I would like to hear from you about your experiences. So um, my question is, I want you to share more about your personal narratives and answer this question. What influenced your interest in religious freedom work and how would you define religious freedom? So I will start with you, Karen. Sure, thank you, Sabrina. And thank you all for, for being here today. And thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, excited to be part of this conversation. Um, so the, I guess the question is, um, what influenced me to get into this space? And um, kind of what is, our, what is my take on religious freedom? Well, um, as Sabrina mentioned, I had an interesting journey to get here. So I actually started off in a completely different field. Um, I spent 15 years in environmental consulting, uh, running a company, um, but I've spent, I am uh, 41 years old and I spent 41 years uh, involved in my community. My parents were extremely active in the Sikh community. Um, growing up, um, I saw you know, a lot of uh, community service and outreach. Um, you know, and really a lot of the, the work that the community does, as, as well as the trials and tribulations of, um, you know, being a minority religious community in this country. Um, that was really crystallized even further post 9-11. Um, the Sikh community has actually been in this country for over uh, a century. Uh, the first Sikhs coming to the uh, West Coast, uh, to California to help build the railroads in the 1890s. Um, so we have a, a, a very strong history in this country, but it's very much hidden as well in terms of our stories and our narratives. Um, and so, since the time of, of coming in the, in the late 1800s, um, we you know, have faced uh, discrimination and issues because of our articles of faith um, and because of the way we look and whether that's from difficulty in getting citizenship to difficulty in practicing our religion with our five articles of faith, which includes a turban, um, a very sort of distinguishing feature of, of our faith. Um, it's, you know, it's been difficult. And that was even more so after 9-11 when we had media imagery of, you know, uh, uh, one of our articles of faith, the, the turban associated with terrorism. We had an increase in, um, you know, hate crimes against the communities. Saldiv did a survey actually last year, um, a 2020 National Sick American Survey that found 58% of uh, Sikh Americans ex experience discrimination based on their articles of faith. Um, so to me, you know, wanting to sort of change that tide through a couple things, through spreading awareness about who we are, um, through building infrastructure so we can increase representation and share our stories. And then of course, and I know we'll talk about this later, um, Sabrina, kind of being there on the front lines when the community really does need that support. Um, but in addition, also working with other communities to really make sure that um, all religions have space to practice their religion freely in this country. Um, that's actually a foundation a tenet of our faith. And it's something that you know, we actively work uh, towards at Saldiv as well. Um, so for, to me, religious freedom really constitutes all of those things. So much, Karen. I, I mean, when when I hear you share that information, um, I, I just sit here thinking fifty eight percent. That's a very large percentage of people to report about experiencing discrimination because of their article of faith, right? Um, so it, it, it speaks to why more of these conversations need to happen. And also why I'm also a champion for religious literacy, for people to understand more about different religious traditions and worldviews. Um, and so, so thank you so much for sharing your story to lead us in this conversation. Uh, Rachel, uh, I see that you're all mute already. So join, yes, if you could join Join us in this conversation and share more about your experience. What got you involved in religious freedom work? 
Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. And hi, everyone. Um, it's so fun to see some familiar faces, some board members. I see heads of secular organizations, heads of religious organizations, seminarians, um, and many friends. So it's so, so fun to be with you all. You know, I love the question, Sabrina, because one of the things that I've found since coming to Americans United, where I frequently speak with people about the religious freedom issue is this has so many different on ramps and touch points. Like as compared to so many other issues, it's like, why do you care about religious freedom? Well, some person will say, because I'm a non-theist or an atheist and I'm discriminated against in the society. Someone will say, because as a Christian, I feel like this is the way kind of like Martin Luther King Jr. said to like assert a conscience on the state, right? They need to be separate. This is a, another person will say, because I really care about public schools and I'm tired of these private school vouchers that are taken away from from public schools. So it's, it's, it's another person will say, because I really care about LGBTQ equality. And I think this is a fundamental piece, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I wish we had time to ask everyone here, you know, why they're, why they care, you know, and I think we'd find a lot of different things. Um, you can even put it in the chat box. Um, that'd be fun to read. But, but for me, you know, I think obviously the starting point is being Jewish and, you know, we're 2% of the population. We're a religious minority, so we don't do so well, you know, in countries that don't have religious freedom generally, you know, and so it's like a fundamental part of feeling like I have equal opportunity and my family does, you know, in this country and safety. I mean, kind of when it boils down to an actual safety. Um, I also think that Jewish, a lot of Jewish people like me though, uh, feel like a, a, you know, feel like the reason that America was able to receive our families in the past is because they were fleeing religious persecution and that this, this country gave us an opportunity to thrive, you know, and we're, we're grateful. And so something I thought about before ex accepting the honor of leading Americans United was, you know, I wanna give back. I think a lot of Jewish people feel like that towards the country, like the country has received us and enabled us to flee persecution. And this is part of the DNA of democracy in the country that I wanna see persevere. Um, the final thing would be that for my career, you know, I have really worked for an inclusive America and I guess, um, I think it takes, you know, like scratch and sniffs. Do you guys remember those where you scratch and then like you smell the, the nice fruit yes. or whatever? <laughs> um, I feel like religious freedom is a little bit like a scratch and sniff when it comes to all of the interconnected issues. Like it's not necessarily right on the surface for everybody to see, but the way that it connects to allowing for social progress to happen and not constantly turning back the clock or being an impediment to it. And I, you know, have really, I continue to learn and I certainly knew something about how often religion in our country and the concept of religious freedom has been misused almost as this unbridled license to um, discriminate, you know, and cause harm to people in this country. And that matters a lot to me to not redefine it that way or to put us, you know, to try to block that, um, that co-opting of religious freedom. So I guess that would be my last reason. Religious freedom really quickly is to me the right to believe whatever you want and be treated the same by the law, equally valued in America. It's the right to change your religious beliefs across the course of your, your lifetime, or as my colleague Rob Boston likes to say, to concoct your own spiritual brew, which you know Reform, Reform Judaism kind of lets you do anyway. Um, and to know that the country will, you know, the laws in our country will treat you just the same as anyone else. Thanks, Sabrina. That's that's too long, and I apologize. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your sharing. One of the things that um, there are a few things that stood out to me is that you said you accepted this job as a way of giving back, right? So it's a way. It's it's also service, right? Service to humanity. Um, service and remembering. You said your community and how your community found safety here um, in the United States because of the right to practice free. Um, at the same time, uh, I like the fact that you said that it allows for social progress to happen. So yeah, if we if we allow it, right, social progress can happen. And there are many different ways in which, uh, and there are many contentious topics, right, that could come up 
in reflecting on how that social progress can happen. And so that's something that we will explore in the work that we've done with AU. And also, um, again, reminding people that religious freedom is the right for one to have freedom of conscience or belief, like to, to practice and for the government not to show preference towards any particular group or any, um, any particular religious or non-religious group, that everyone has equal treatment under the law. And so that is something that is um, prioritized in our work. And our framework is the First Amendment in doing that work. But also for those that aren't aware, and we don't do international religious freedom work here, but uh, put it on your radar to check out the UN Declaration of Human Rights um, in Article 18, which provides that around the world, everyone has the right to freedom of conscience or belief in theory in some places, right? And not necessarily in practice. And so we have to remember that. So thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate that. Charles, please come into this conversation, share more with us about the work. Uh, what brought you into the religious freedom work in, in doing this work? I'm muted myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina. And uh, thank you for uh, everybody that's joined us and my uh, fellow panelists during this, um, you know, it's a couple of things that brought me in. Um, I'm from a small town, Millen, Georgia. And when you talk about diversity in Millen, Georgia, you mean male, female, black and white, and that's it. You don't mean anything else. And so that's how I grew up. And I grew up with segregated proms. I grew up with black and white homecoming kings and queens. So there was these lines of distinction um, where I grew up from and um, fortunately, Fortunately and unfortunately, I, I decided to go to the Citadel after that. And pretty much, uh, yeah, that didn't help <laughs> at all with, with, with those things. Um, everybody was supposed to be the same. And that's when I first learned that if you try to make everybody the same, then you're mostly going to go with whatever the majority is. And so that's how everybody's going to look. So whether it's religion, whether it's gender, whether it's anything, Whatever the majority is, that's what everybody's going to try to be like. So um, trying to make everybody the same wasn't the answer. Um, so went into seminary, um, and when I really got defined of what um, it meant to me to have religious freedom and why I wanted to fight for it was when I was a chaplain at the Children's Hospital. And it didn't matter what somebody's religion was at Children's Hospital. Everybody wanted the same thing. Everybody wanted everybody's child to survive. So we did whatever it took to help uh, parents um, feel comfortable enough to practice whatever their religion they want to practice or not practice a religion so that they could be in the best position to help their children to survive. And it motivated me to want to work at BJC because I found an organization that was trying to fight for everybody's rights for religious freedom and then those that didn't have religious freedom. Now, personally, I will say, um, it's kind of different than what, what, what Rachel has experienced. Uh, I don't uh, fight for religious liberty in America because America gave me religious liberty. I fight for religious liberty in America because America did not give me religious liberty um, because I don't know what my ancestors uh, practice because that was stripped from me and I was given a religion. And it took me until adulthood to be able to say, hmm, there's some things I want to keep here, some things I don't want to keep. What were the things that were taught to me that were said that were evil and you need to throw that away? And let me go find those things because there's some evil people that told me to leave those evil things. Right? So maybe those things weren't so evil. So for me, religious liberty is very important. So I have the opportunity to look back, find, and in the future, change my mind. That's why I love religious liberty. That's why I fight for religious liberty. If you want me to define religious liberty, I'll put it in, you know, the the right for me to change my mind when I get new information every day. And the same for somebody else. And they don't have to agree with mine. Uh, we at BJC, we, we do say a little Christian slogan sometimes uh, about religious liberty. Um, you know, that do unto others as <laughs> they would do unto you. But if you don't want somebody hindering your religious liberty, don't hinder somebody else's religious, li religious liberty. If you don't want somebody uh, promoting somebody else's religious liberty, then you don't ask people to promote yours. Have it even all, all across the board. Um, I know it's, it's, it's better 
easier said than done sometimes, but sometimes when we make things simpler, we, we do we do it better. When I used to play football, I used to say, keep it simple, stupid. I know it's kiss if <laughs> some of y'all play for, but sometimes we need to bring that into this. Just keep it simple. If you didn't want somebody to do that to you, don't do it to somebody else. Wow, Charles, thank you. You said that um, it's the right to change my mind when I receive new information. And I love that, right? And that's what part of this session is about, people to, uh, people receiving access to new information. For some people, it might not be new information. It might be um, what they already know. But I think that's powerful. At the same time, I love the fact that you showed exactly why we have to have these conversations. The distinction in your experience from Rachel's experience, from Karen's experience, says that there are many different perspectives about religious freedom and how racial and religious minority people in this country have been treated. And so we have to have these conversations. But I love the fact that um, you said it's not, uh, it's not about trying, you said not trying to make everyone the same that was not the answer, right? And you also spoke to the reality that um, most people, we, we love our children, right? And so your experience in working at the Children's Hospital just said, I'm here for everyone. I want everyone to live and I want everyone to thrive. And that's what we also experience in our work at Americans United when we're advocating for issues because we want people to live and thrive and to show up in the world and the way in which they were created and the way in which they believe they are. And so, um, and so thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to pin all three of you, uh, but Charles, I'm going to start with asking you, well, I'll, I'll leave you here. I'm going to start with asking you this question because you came down this path. Um, over, the, over the last three years, you and I had the pleasure of working together on the Religious Freedom African American Perspectives Project that was funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. And in doing this work, um, the BJC made a bold move in its priorities by addressing the organization's complicit, um, the complicity on race issues and um, in the 1940s and the 1960s, as well as addressing Christian nationalism. Um, additionally, the BJC um, this year has hosted various programs highlighting the many voices of religious freedom. Um, can you just share with those that are attending the session as well as our panelists, um, like from the BJC perspective, like how would you define Christian nationalism? So what is Christian nationalism? And why is it important to talk about it in a discussion with racial, Rachel, uh, I'm saying Rachel, racial and <laughs> Religious minorities. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I got you. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. So, um, I think part of your question is, you know, why was it important? How did it come about? Um, we've been around for eighty-five years, at BJC. Now, think about eighty-five years. You know, think how much has changed. Um, think how much our uh, our board, our partners, the people that we've worked with, think how much they've changed. Think how much our staff has probably changed. Um, think how much, uh, you know, our, like I say, our board again has changed, our representatives, the people that know us. So once you bring other people into the room and they get a seat at the table, um, for me, it's a personal thing. You give me a seat at the table, I'm, I'm brought in the table. We're not, <laughs> you, you messed up. If you didn't want the table to expand, don't bring me in. All right. So when they brought me in, there's more voices. So now we have more voices that need to be heard and it can't be the same voices all the time. And so part of that leads into Christian nationalism. Um, the, and, and there's a wide range of definitions for Christian nationalism, but I try to keep it uh, simple and keep it kind of country, you know, just, um, basically it's, it's the combining of Christianity and, you know, so this American pride or patriotism that you have to have both and, and be both to actually be an American. So to be a good American, you have to be Christian. And to be a good Christian, you have to be an American, you know, patriotic. It's like, no, that's not, that's not how it works. And so um, we've had this campaign for the last several years now, Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Uh, you can go there to that, to that website and sign a statement. Uh, we felt that, it, you know, unfortunately, when something happens and uh, an event happens, people assign terrorism to certain religious groups. Well, um, we at BJC would say, well, you know, we can't ask other people to speak out against what Christians have been doing. 
Um, and we've had Christian white terrorism in the United States. And so it's time for Christians to speak out against those things that are happening in that way. So that was the emphasis for um, Christians against Christian nationalism. But Christian nationalism is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a problem because what it does, it eliminates other voices. Um, and then it becomes a racial elimination. I think the, the part where you see people against uh, critical race theory, those are the same people that want to Christian that, the people that want to only um, talk about American history in a way that is um, highlighting the good things, but don't highlight the bad things. You're silencing voices you, 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 when you do that. And so personally, and I'll, I'll sum it up this way, I learned and I believe that we have a creator. Now, everybody doesn't have to believe that, and that's, that's fine. But at this point in my life, I believe that we have a creator. And if we have a creator, then all of the creator's creation can teach me something about the creator. So if I silence any voice of the creator, then I'm lacking and I'm, I'm not being fulfilled. And so I don't want that. I want to learn from everybody. And so Christian nationalism just goes against that. And it, part of it is just, uh, the other part of it is just, it's just not American. It's funny, you, they want to talk about Christian nationalism as American. It's not American. It's not freedom. You, you say you at, want freedom and this is what it stands for, yet you are not giving the same freedoms to everybody. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate your sharing. Um, Karen, that brings me to you. I see, because I, I see you nodding your head. And so I was like, let me bring Karen back into this guy, the conversation here. So I have, uh, I have another question for you um, with that. So the Sikh community, as you mentioned, has been here since the 1800s, right? And you said the Sikh community has been a part of the fabric of American society pretty much for centuries, ma has made tremendous contributions um, to the military, to medicine, to education and politics um, and many more areas. Yet in the last two decades, we've witnessed an increase in racially and religiously motivated hate crimes targeting the Sikh community. And so for 25 years, um, you shared this is the 25th anniversary of Saldiv. Um, the Saldiv has been on the front lines providing education and advocacy about the Sikh community. So um, in light of the recent um, tragic events that took place in Indianapolis and San Jose. Can you share with us um, how Sadov has pr prioritized education and your legal work um, in supporting the impacted families as well as educating the public even more about the Sikh community? Sure, no, absolutely. And thank you for your question, Sabrina. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as you mentioned, um, the Sikh community did, did face a uh, a recent tragedy um, in the form of the mass shooting in Indianapolis. I was on the ground for 10 days. So one of the things, Saldef does um, a number of things and has a number of initiatives and I would classify them into sort of a crisis um, response um, and then sort of non-crisis infrastructure building. So, uh, you know, I was on the ground, you know, things like mental health resources, getting in language support, providing legal support for the families, um, helping them navigate through financial resources, helping them connect with, you know, um, you know, different parties, whether it's the FBI, law enforcement, um, you know, um, DOJ, making sure that they understand the process, the information is getting communicated. So Saldif does a lot of, you know, provides a lot of those services and we've been providing them for 25 years. So just the fact that we've been providing these services for 25 years kind of, I think is certainly a sort of a statement of where things are and how things um, unfortunately many times have, uh, you know, affected our community. Um, we also have focused on um, infrastructure building and Charles mentioned um, this idea or this concept of having a seat at the table and, and what that means. Um, so we, you know, certainly that has been a focus for Saldef, uh, you know, as a minority religion, being able to have a voice and share our perspective is really important, um, not just for, for ourselves, but also for other, you know, other communities that, you know, don't um, necessarily have representation and, you know, we can speak also from the minority perspective. So we have our sick lead program um, where we've encouraged our uh, sick students to uh, get legislative internships. We've, we've provided that or facilitated that. And they have leadership programming for the summer. Um, we've had a number of our um, 
you know, sick American students go on to either run for elected office or take positions on Capitol Hill or in the White House. Um, so we're hoping to get our community more civically engaged. We also do, um, you know, work around um, civic participation of our community. We have a program we've, we've run called Sick Boat. Um, so we do, you know, we have that program um, to encourage our community to be registered and to understand their voting rights, uh, understand policy issues. Um, Saldaf also, um, as I mentioned, or you mentioned in my bio, I, we do training and education to um, different agencies. We, we do it, um, you know, at the state and local level. I got my start um, doing sick awareness training for law enforcement in New Jersey. And the law enforcement training actually got started because of an incident in Texas. And actually this type of incident has, has been repeated, not just in Texas elsewhere, where a member of the sick community had a break-in called law enforcement. Um, law enforcement came and then due to the articles of faith that that individual was wearing, ended up uh, apprehending the individual that called law enforcement for help. Um, so, and again, that incident has been repeated elsewhere. So we have tried to go in and explain, you know, the religion, the significance of the articles of faith, uh, what it means. Um, and that's a program that's been, I think, going on for about 15 years. Um, so that's another aspect of what SALDEV does. We do that for not only for law enforcement, for TSA, we've had a lot of, you know, racial profiling at airports. Um, that the communities had to contend with. Um, we've done training with DOJ. I, I actually last year did training with the FBI. Um, so it's a continually, continually, you know, engaging and educating others. Um, and then we do know your rights uh, training for a community where we do have members of different agencies come into our spaces, which are our gurdwaras or community centers to talk about different issues. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, you know, a constant effort, um, but yes, yeah, sort of lumped into to those two areas. Um, the other thing I just wanted to add, you know, as, as we're talking about this discussion and religious freedom, you know, I did a lot of thinking before I came to this discussion. I know we had the prep call uh, last week, um, you know, just kind of thinking about religious freedom and what it means and what it means in the sick American community. Um, and I think from, you know, from our perspective, um, the Sikh American community and the Sikh community broadly has faced um, persecution actually, um, you know, abroad. It, the Sikhism was founded in Punjab and in India, and there's been, we're also a minority religion in India, and there's been issues, you know, over time in the 80s and 90s, um, where Sikhs were actually persecuted in India itself um, and, and have come over here. So uh, in terms of sort of this idea of religious freedom, I guess it's it's a, a low bar in some in some senses um, because of some of the issues that happened at that time. Um, but if I think about some of the calls and some of the work that we do, you know, I mean, just even this past week, we got a call from somebody that was um, not allowed to enter a hospital building where his wife uh, was, um, you know, undergoing uh, treatment because of his articles of faith. I almost wonder, you know. Does our community really have religious freedom? Because right now, because we, you know, there's so many instances, and I and we I get them these calls all year long. And it's not that our community views it from that perspective. I think very much so because of some of the things that have happened abroad. They're appreciative to be in this country and with you know people of diverse faiths and backgrounds. And we look at it as a you know opportunity to move the needle forward. Like so, when you mentioned the military. Um, I know I'm, I'm good friends with Gamal Kalsi, who was the first Sikh American in the army to be able to serve with his Articles of Faith. And that opened the doors for, you know, people from all different faith backgrounds to be able to serve, right? So we were, he was able to sort of set that precedent, but it's an ongoing struggle because, um, you know, I, I don't think I would be honest, you know, in, in sharing here if I didn't say that, you know, we, I frequently get these calls and, um, you know, unfortunately, there's many spaces and places here where, um, you know, we keep, you know, having to sort of to push the ball forward. And um, it's not a given that um, we'll be able to practice in the way that, uh, you know, many, many in our community would like to. Thank you, Karen. You know, that that kind of resonated with me in many different ways. And I'm sure some of you that may be watching that resonated. 
uh, with you. And Charles put it in the chat that there's a difference between acceptance and tolerance. It, it absolutely is. You know, um, tolerance is, you know, you can come to the party, but you just got, you got to sit down the whole time, right? Whereas acceptance is, you can come to the party, you can help select the music, you can help like decorate. There's a big difference in being invited into a space and included in every aspect of it. And um, I know that uh, one of my friends, I know Charles has interviewed uh, Kathy Joshi, who wrote the book, um, White, uh, White Christian Privilege, uh, The Illusion of religious, um, uh, religious Equality in America. And there is some truth to that, which is why we're having this conversation today. When you have to think of you know, unfortunately, this, the events that happened in Indianapolis and San Jose, when you think about the Tree of Life incident that happened, when you think about what happened at Char in Charleston, South Carolina, as well as Metropolitan AME, and no, no, a number other places that I can't, I don't have enough time to mention, right? It says something about Whose religious freedom are we talking about in America? And so with that, I want to bring Rachel into the conversation because um, Rachel, Americans United has been doing uh, this work for nearly 75 years. And most people, uh, most people are not aware that the organization was founded by religious leaders, right? And so, um, so we have to, you know, share that information and help people understand that. But at the same time, um, and uh, at the same time, recently, you wrote in Church, Church of State magazine, which is AU's um, magazine. So you can, you can find it online if you go to our media section and click on magazine. But uh, you talked about the lessons that you've learned during the pandemic. And so I would like for you to share more about the lessons that you've learned and then how AU has addressed some of the issues in the last year that continues to impact society. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I've been really enjoying the conversation too. And I, and I do really agree Kieran, with what Kieran said. I mean, I think I saw Charles nodding his head and I was nodding my head and Kieran, you were saying it about like, hmm, is there really religious freedom in this country for all of us? And I think we're all from communities where our religious institutions have been attacked, you know, and, um, and so we can all relate to the feeling that, or the knowledge perhaps, that no, you know, there is an actual religious freedom for all of us. And I'll add that, you know, a lot of our members who are uh, atheists, you know, tell me horrible stories about the way they're treated. You know, one of them was assigned to be the executor for his dad's estate when his dad died and his sibling, and he's from the South and his siblings put him on the stand and tried to discredit him from being the executor on the basis that he's a non-believer or an atheist. Um, and I mean, that, that's one of a million, you know, stories. So I think um, pretty much when you're not a, a certain type of white Christian, right, that you face discrimination. The, the reason I say that is because we have a client, Amy Madonna, who's a white Catholic in the South who tried to foster, help foster some kids because she grew up with foster siblings and has a big heart and she's a mom and she has the resources to be able to do it. And she went through the rig rigorous application process and she was turned away by the government funded foster care agency because she's the wrong kind of Christian, right? Because she's Catholic and not evangelical Protestant in, in her community in South Carolina. And you know, we obviously are, are seeing a Supreme Court case that will never come down called Fulton, you know, which is about, which is seven months now from its oral argument, but again, which is about the same, you know, question of whether, you know, government funded entities can discriminate on religious grounds, basically. You know, in this case, religious opposition to the LGBTQ community. Um, but you know, Sabrina, you asked me. What are some lessons that I learned from the pandemic? So let me try to just hone in on that about religious freedom. You know, and I think, you know, one thing that I really saw is the way our opponents will take advantage of a crisis to advance and assert religious privilege. So here we are, you know, completely down and out and we see 
a spate of lawsuits, you know, many of which reached the Supreme Court. We filed over 50 friend of the court briefs in them where religious communities are trying to claim that they have special religious privileges to meet even where the public safety officials from the government are saying no one can meet. And even when it's proven that you know this starts a rash of infection, both within the religious community, which is terrible, and in the community, you know, the broader community. So, you know, th that was devastating to watch, and it was devastating to see the Supreme Court grant that religious privilege, right? Which is a huge problem because, you know, Kieran, you said like, do we even have religious freedom? What's happening, and what we're witnessing, and, and I think I saw, I think it's Dwayne put in the put in the in the chat box, you know, like we never have, you know, so we've always seen this kind of misuse of 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 religion and religious freedom to be able to, you know, oppress people, basically. Um, but I think, you know, what we're seeing today is this another huge wave of the push to turn this very sacred to democracy concept of religious freedom. And by the way, and sacred to a lot of different religious denominations too. Right, not just to democracy, but to religion, right? Because most religion, most religions have recognized that it's essential to preserve the separation of religion and government for the sake of their religion, you know, so that they don't have government interference. But we're seeing this effort to turn what was this sort of sacred concept to democracy into religious privilege. So anyway, we saw that, and I think we saw again how our opponents are anti-science, right? I'm in the same you know, folks that were parading with the Jesus banners and the Camp Auschwitz t-shirts in front of the Capitol on January 6th are refusing vaccines, you know, and they're, um, you know, they're, they're thwarting science sort of right and left by saying we want to meet even when it's proven that meeting during a pandemic spreads the disease and kills people. Um, and that's something that a lot of our sort of base of supporters know and recognize, you know, but I don't think everybody does. Similarly, I don't think everybody recognizes how opponents of church state separation ultimately are rejecting democracy. And I mean, I think that's sort of like a, a step too far for like how far a lot of people have gone down the path of thinking about religious freedom. But I, you know, I do think that the January 6th display, which, which was composed not exclusively of, but of a lot of white Christian nationalists in the same group did really showcase what the ultimate goals are, right? Which is not democracy because democracy is predicated on equality and equality is predicated on freedom and essential to freedom is freedom of religion, right? And so if you oppose freedom, then ultimately, if you go up that chain back up to equality to democracy, you are opposing democracy, you know, and I think that really was sort of on vivid display, you know, so was the fact that opponents of church state separation are opponents of racial equality, opponents of basically, or I would say proponents of white, straight, cisgender, male power in society. And I think that was really on display too, because this transactional relationship that Trump had with this one element, this base of his, which was against religious freedom for all, just for their own religious freedom, like you were saying earlier, Sabrina, were pushing the trans military ban, pushing all these denial of care rules that were targeting LGBTQ people and reproductive freedom, you know, and pushing rules that that were punishing to religious minorities and non-believers as well. So I, I think there was a lot of lessons that we learned. There was a little bit of hope though, right? Because people rallied to defeat it, at least a part of it. It's, it's still there. I don't wanna, not to defeat the whole thing. The movement is very much alive, but we did change leadership and that was really important. Thank you, Rachel. No. Uh, you talked about equality and democracy, and that shows up in prioritizing freedom of conscience, freedom of religion for all, and making sure that those rights are protected 
for all. I can't emphasize for all enough. Um, and so uh, I, I know we're running short on time. I have more questions. I'm sitting here wishing I had made this call until 530, but I was also mindful that people get off work at, the, at five o'clock. So I didn't want to hold people too long. Um, you raised so many things in, in all of your sharing. And so um, and thinking about those that are marginalized in this country, whether they're racial or religious minority, or whether they're someone that identifies as, as, as an LGBTQ um, IA person, that you know everyone has human rights. Um, and but I also have this question. So we realize that this work that we do, all of us do, um, we all have different perspectives and different beliefs. And so I want to know. What are some of the challenges and opportunities that come with interfaith collaboration or coalition work? And furthermore, what happens if we stop talking about religious freedom through our unique and collective um, and our collective experiences. So I know we do coalition work um, at American United. I'm fortunate to work with the Faith for Equality uh, Coalition group. And I know people have many different perspectives and we've talked about the LGBTQ community a bit on this call, but I know people have different perspectives on that. But one of the things that I know we're championing right now is the Equality Act and also the Do No Harm Act, but also um, at the base of that, it goes goes back to human dignity. So to answer that question, I'd like anyone that wants to jump in, what do you believe are some of the most pressing issues around religious freedom and what are the challenges and opportunities that come with doing interfaith collaboration? This is real talk, so feel <laughs> free to share. I'll give, <laughs> Charles, you look like you, you're ready <laughs> to jump in, but you're muted. <laughs> I was muted on purpose. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, 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 I'm listening to your question. I'm looking at Dwayne's question um, in the chat here. Um, the challenges, it, the thing about interfaith is that you're dealing with humans. I love humans, but we are, we're something else. Uh, <laughs> and we have so many issues that uh, cross. And, and so, I'm, I'll give it to you in, a, in, 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 I come to this conversation as a black male, um, heterosexual black male, uh, military background, all that type of stuff. But I also come to this conversation as somebody from the South, as I, like before, and I, 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 I hearken back to W.E.B. Du Bois when he was talking about the dual, the dualism that's in it and in a black body. I'm, I'm Christian, but then I find myself, oh man, the Christians that, I was following down here, didn't treat the people that looked like me the same. So uh, I got a dual, a dual stuff like that. And we, we talked about um, some of the economic concerns and um, policies that, um, that, that are out there. Um, I don't care what president has been, some of our foreign policies have, uh, have, have relationships with, with religious uh, entities. And so we have to be able to have that conversation at some point. Um, and I think uh, another big part of it is <clears throat> not avoiding anything, you know, to, to be able to um, have a place where we can when do, do this, where we can have these. So these, these conversations like this is, is important, but we have more people doing this. And so for me, the, the thing that's, that's harming us the most is <clears throat> we've gotten to the point where we're a, for those who like sports, uh, we've become a rivalry. We've become the Yankees versus the Red Sox. Um, if you're where I'm from, it's Georgia versus Florida. You can't do anything with the other side. So once you call the other side the devil or the enemy, then you can't work with the other side. You can't work with the devil or the enemy. So we're, we don't sit down and have these conversations. So the people that are on this call, it's almost we're preaching to the choir. The people that need to hear this are never gonna sit down because they see certain names in this, Americans united against separate church. I don't like them. You got some people that come to BJC. Oh, y'all Baptists, and then they sit down and be like, oh, not that type of Baptist. You got a Sikh. What, what's a Sikh? Uh, they all Muslims to me. I don't care. I'm just gonna. The people that need to uh, be a part of this uh, aren't a part of it. And so there has to be a way for some of us to step across that line on the days we can and say, you know what? I'm going to sit down with, or I'm going to go speak with these people that are different than me. And also have enough self-care to say, you know what, Charles, you did it today. Uh, Karen, you do it tomorrow. 
Sabrina, you did it the next day. We can, you, you can't try to take it all by yourself. So um, getting together and being able to talk through all the issues that, that we have. Karen, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, Charles said a lot. I mean, I think, you know, part of it is really being able to have like open and honest conversations. <laughs> I think obviously there's a lot of commonalities between different religions, but there are spaces where, you know, there you know, issues that can be challenging. Um, there may be historical issues, there may be philosophical issues. So I think sort of, you know, being in those spaces um, is important. And I think we don't have enough of those conversations. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, from the Sick American perspective, I think I shared, you know, spaces where we do try to collaborate with other religious groups around issues of religious freedom. Um, and from a faith perspective, that is sort of the Sikh perspective generally, you know, it's very much um, a religion that respects others and, um, you know, believes in, we believe in sort of the dignity and humanity of all. Um, I think, you know, the challenge is always, you know, as a minority religion, you know, coming to these spaces, there's, you know, a lot to share and learn. And, and I was talking to actually a colleague of mine earlier um, before the session, you know, we we're talking about kind of coming into these spaces and, and I never know like where to start, you know, about explaining about Sikhism, like, do we start like at the, at the very beginning or, or do we do I kind of just give a brief summary, like depending on where and what people know. Um, so I think, you know, th those are just some, some thoughts regarding, um, you know, interfaith work. The, the only other thing I will share really briefly, I know we're running short on time. I did have the opportunity to um, really work closely when I was out in Indianapolis. Um, with uh, CIC, um, Center for um, Inter, uh, Interfaith Cooperation in Indianapolis. I don't know if you guys are familiar, um, like wonderful group. And I spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, we were organizing a memorial service and some, some really great people were helping to get faith leaders from all backgrounds to come and speak. And as, um, you know, I, I was chatting with, with some of the, the people from the center um, in helping to organize the event, we were just sort of chatting about, um, you know, why, you know, we should be doing more interfaith outreach. It, it's important for people to understand the different faith perspectives. Um, but, you know, a lot of times, and I can say that's also, you know, within the Sikh community, I imagine it's similar in other communities, you know, you have your own community politics, and then you, you know, like you're sort of trying to then reach out to other communities, and, and sometimes it can get, you know, confusing. Um, and we were just sort of like having kind of a chuckle about how, you know, it seems like there's people from, from all religions that really want to like work together and like cooperate and move towards these goals. And then we all have some folks that just, you know, more of like the difficult people to deal with it and make, make life more challenging in that regard. So it's actually oddly like a commonality in coming together where, where you could talk about like hey this you know in my community this are some of the challenges and and you know in, in trying to like work towards these goals and I think actually those conversations are really healthy and um I I wish we would share more of them because it's um it's actually you know kind of cathartic and just um you know you feel a sense of community and bond with people as, as you learn about you know challenges uh, across different communities. Yeah, yes. and should I add to that, Sabrina? Yes, Rachel, and I just wanted to say for anyone that needs to jump off the call, feel free to do so. Um, I, but uh, for those that would like to stay, we invite you to do so. Yes, Rachel, please. And I'll try to make this brief, but I, was, I think something I'd like to add, I totally agree with my colleagues, is I think we need to remember to loop in the non-religious, right? I mean, we are coming from, this is a seminar um, which is tried to be very inclusive of the faith community and to really remind the faith community to re-engage with this issue, which we absolutely must do. But we really have a country that is increasingly non-religious or at least not religiously affiliated, you know, even if spiritual. And I think it can be really hard for the religious and non-religious communities to coexist peacefully in the same spaces. Or maybe I should say, trust one another is like a better way to put it. I think there's a lot of reason on both sides for, for mistrust or, or hurt feelings, which is maybe where mistrust comes from. But I think that in order for us to, you know, gather the army, 
and really do this right, that we really have to go forward together because it matters to each and every one of us, right? And that's how we're gonna be at our strongest. So I think I would just add that and then maybe add the idea that we have an urgency problem. You know, Dwayne was asking in the chat, how are we, what, was it, I don't remember who was asking, sorry, it could be Reverend Wayne Johnson, but someone was asking, how are we gonna break through? You know, how are we gonna break through? And that is a, that is the question. And I think one thing that's stopping us from breaking through, we just did a poll and only like a quarter of Americans, no, not even a quarter, excuse me, a fifth of Americans said that they think religious freedom is under very serious threat. And only 16% of Americans said it's one of the most important issues to them personally. I and mean, we were at 60% for it's important, at least somewhat, you know, within that. But I think we need to be louder you know, about what we all know to be true, right? The threat, you know, and the salience of it, but what a lot of people don't understand. Absolutely. I, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and for your contributions to the conversation. I apologize to the audience that we didn't have more time for you to ask questions, but I do want to encourage you to come back next week for the AU Summer Series. One of the things that you witnessed today is that we have many different experiences, we have many different perspectives, but at the same time, we can come together and work on an issue that prioritizes all of us and all of our humanity. And that is religious freedom, protecting religious freedom for all and church state separation. And so um, again, I invite you to come back next week. One of the things I do wanna to respond to is um, Dwayne, your question about how do we get this conversation into the mainstream? You tell others about it, right? Like you sat, you, you sat here, you listened, you engage, well, you really didn't get to engage as much, but the chat was busy, but you, you had the opportunity to weigh in. Tell other people about the work that's happened at through these different organizations, be it BJC, be it Saldiv, or AU. Um, also, like take opportunities to find out what org what interfaith organization exists in your community that you can engage with to learn more about other religious traditions and, and even non-religious people. Because here's the thing, there are non-religious people that are part of interfaith organizations. And so it's important for us to get a broader understanding of the work that's happening in this country um, to help move us all forward and prioritize all of our needs. Um, so I'm gonna share the link again to register for next week's session if you haven't done so. Thank you so much, David, I appreciate you. At the same time, I'm going to add into the chat. I mentioned um, Colors of Pride. Again, AU is one of the co-sponsors for the Colors of Pride event. This is basically about communities, religious communities coming together um, to support uh, queer, black and brown communities and prioritizing equality for all. There are a series of events that will be taking place. Um, June 11th through the 19th. I, I just, I'll show my, share my screen real quick so you can see the flyer for that. Um, but I encourage you to go to the website to learn more about it. Again, um, religious freedom is a human dignity issue. It's about human rights. And so we all have a role and responsibility in talking about this um, issue and advancing the conversation and doing the work. If you wanna know more, please visit about the work that we're doing at Americans United, visit au.org. We have an AU Action Network that if you really wanna get involved, you can jump in and uh, sign up to receive action alerts. And for religious leaders, we have the Faith Leaders United um, Network. So I invite you to explore the website, learn more, go to, BJ, go to the BJC website, go to Saldiv. Um, um, also, last plug, and then I will end the call, is um, I get a weekly newsletter from Saldiv that makes me aware of what's happening in the Sikh community. Because um, if we're going to do the work, we have to be intentional about what's, what's happening in the different communities that we say we care and we love and that we're championing. So um, I want to thank all of you for joining us 
for today's conversation. Join us next week when we talk about um, what's at stake for church state separation. We'll have our VP of Public Policy, Maggie Garrett, that will be um, presenting for us next week. And again, I just want to say thank you to all of you. If you have questions that um, we didn't answer and they were in the chat, please feel free to email me, um, dent at au.org. I'll be happy to get the questions to our panelists. And um, again, thank you to all of our panelists for spending time with us this afternoon, for sharing your perspectives. And I'm grateful that this is not just transactional for us, but this is relational because we do have relationships with the work that we do together. And so again, thank you everyone. And I wish you a great day. Be well, stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>